What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Rabbit Hole Recap. We're here on Thursday. Early rip for us. Matthew is uh, traveling in the southern part of the United States. Uh, so we're gonna road rip a little... trip. How's your road trip been? What's the South like these days? It's fucking gorgeous, man. It's uh, the South is alive and well. Yes, it is. How uh, how many guns have you seen so far? <laughs> No, I mean, I haven't, it's, it's not like, p, p, yeah, in the South, people just like, you know, they would just walk around with their guns all over the place. You just walk into the Starbucks, they got guns. I'm kidding, freaks, I would never go to Starbucks. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I fucking love traveling, right? And it seems like international travel is at least going to be a pain in the ass for a little bit longer, at least. Um, so uh, it seems good a time as ever to get the road tripping in. And... Yeah. First time in South Carolina. Ooh. Uh, first time in Georgia. I really like I Georgia Savannah's fucking dope as fuck. I've never been to Savannah before. It is a really underrated city. Yes, that's what we were uh, talking about before we hit record. Uh open container laws don't exist there. You can walk around. Allen's gets all the credit. No one ever talks about that in Savannah. Are there yeah. other cities that have open container laws? Uh or don't have open container laws, I guess. I would imagine there are. I don't, I don't know. know. Shout it out, freaks. If you know yeah. a city where you can walk down the street drinking a beer, ideally looking at water. I like looking at water while I'm drinking the beer. Yeah. The breeze in my hair. But open container in general is a huge plus. Another little uh, known fact about Savannah. I don't think it's number one. I said it was number one St. Paddy's Day celebration, but now thinking in my mind, I think Chicago may have that. That... Uh, <coughs> that mantle uh but savannah's definitely top two or three saint patrick's day celebrations in the country which is interesting considering it's in georgia where'd you stop in south carolina um in south carolina we stopped in columbia Ooh, oh so you ripped it through the middle of the state uh yeah because we were in charlotte north carolina and greensboro um I'm like, there's gotta something be careful with the cities I say. I'm, I'm kind of, I have friends in places where I'm, I'm going to meet friends and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh. but uh, yeah, this was like my first time in all these states. I never, I don't, I had never gotten this. I, I think I had never been in like the southeast besides like Florida and uh, Texas is south, just completely south, right? Yeah, I guess I, this this country is so fucking huge. People just don't really appreciate how big it is. It's massive. That's actually... Can, uh, I could spend decades just driving around this country and not see the same thing over again. It really hit me uh, in high school. I was doing a driver's ed class. You got to take driver's ed classes here. Uh, not actually in the car, but like a class where you, you learn about the road and best practices to get your insurance down. And the, uh, the driver's ed teacher who came and taught us that class... Uh, really drove it home the fact that you could drive for like three days in Europe and cross like twenty countries or something like that. In here, you can barely get like coast to coast in this one country. America's vast; it's beautiful. That'd it's be very- a pretty intense three day coast to coast drive, right? No, exactly. Um, yeah, Americans take for granted how big and beautiful this country is. Go see it if you're if you're an American. Also, like Airbnbs and hotels right now are cheap as fuck, guys. <laughs> really fucking cheap. Right. I'm actually looking. Uh, I'm looking to hit wine country in January, and things are are very cheap right now. Hoping um, that we can make that happen. I think we might just get rid of the apartment and just do like four or five months of road tripping and just like stay at Airbnbs for three weeks here, three weeks there. It's not a bad idea. We're just getting cheaper cheaper than New York city. Just get an RV. Stay in the RV. I don't know about the RV idea. I'm like, I go back and forth. Why is too daunting to handle or it's like, first of all, it's definitely annoying, more annoying to drive. Right. Uh, Um, yes. I think there's, I think there's two types of people. I think there's people that usually go over the speed limit, and then there's people that are always dutifully five miles an hour below the speed limit. I'm not going to say specifically which category I'm in. I'm in the former. I'm always 15 to 20 
I think an RV for extended periods of time would could be annoying to that type of person. Um, and then the other thing is, I hear like there's like a lot of maintenance, like a lot of maintenance headaches can come up. You gotta. Yeah, the septic tank alone is something I'd, I'd probably want to stay away from. I had I have uh, friends, this couple, who right at the beginning of uh, Rona realized like what the fuck was going on, and they got out of their Seattle lease. And they bought an RV, and they've just been driving around working remote from the RV, um, which I thought was pretty badass. But then, like, week three, uh, like, in the the middle of the workday, just their toilet started overflowing into, <laughs> into the RV. Like, their home and their car is, like, all in the same place, just filled with fucking sewage. Uh, at least it was their own. So yeah, at least it was their own. For them. But, but yeah, yeah, I think with Airbnb is so cheap, might as well just go Airbnb to Airbnb. I like that move. I do. I am uh, getting a little stir crazy myself. I haven't been. Uh, we went home to Philadelphia for a couple of days this week. That was a nice little reprieve. Uh, really disgruntled. Like a lot of people walking outside by themselves with masks. Philadelphians, come on. It's Get weird. Up. The outside thing is weird. It's very weird. It's uh, it's a lot of vir- it's a virtue signal, but. Uh, speaking of signals, I don't know if it's a virtue signal. I think for most people, it's not. I think it's just a like a fear thing. It is a fear thing. All right, and so if you are out there and you're fearful, uh, some some stats came out earlier today. I don't know if this globally or just here in the U.S. I'm going to read them out loud. Uh, this comes from Dr. David Samadi, M.D. at Dr. David Samadi, S-A-M-A-D-I. On Twitter, new COVID-19 survival rates per the CDC. So this is probably uh, the United States only. Age ranges 0 to 19, you're going to have a 99.997% survival rate. Ages 20 to 49, you're going to have a 99.98 survival rate. Ages 50 to 69, you're going to have a 99.5 survival rate. Number, and if you're 70 or over, your survival rate is going to be 94.6%, uh, which is... If you're 70 or over, that's a 3.4% chance of death, or excuse me, a 5.4% chance of death is uh, nothing to scoff at. But uh, I think for the younger ages, 70 and under, survival rate is 99.5% and above. So uh, should we be fearful? I don't know. This is amazing news, but people may look and at we this. Don't, we don't know. Is that... Uh, that's... It's and it's already that's only if you get it right, so it's even it's even less likely. Yes, yeah, so I guess that's only if you get it and test positive. Um, so there's right because pl- if if you if you only have like a one percent chance of getting it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Right. Yeah. So f- or is that f- is that factoring that in already? Probably no, not. It's, no. Yeah, it's, not, it's survival rate. So you have to have had it first in the first place. Yeah, there you go. Um, take that data as you wish decide to be fearful or, or not i personally am not as afraid of this as i was when it first came um but this isn't a covid podcast this is a bitcoin podcast and the price of bitcoin right now according to clark moody's dashboard is ten thousand six hundred fifty dollars if you're buying a dollar's worth of sats you're going to get nine thousand three hundred and ninety sats uh bitcoin's market cap still hovering around 200 billion slightly under it at 196.9 billion dollars you're going to get 5.7 ounces of gold Per Bitcoin, uh, thank you for fixing the percentage there, Clark. That's 1.64 percent of the total gold market cap, and you're going to get 261 barrels of oil uh, with one Bitcoin right now. Uh, right now, we're at block eight 649,811. Uh, we had a difficulty adjustment since our last episode, and it was a pretty significant one. We have a difficulty all-time high, uh, 19.3 trillion. I believe it's trillion. Actually, it could be a lot higher. I just have trillion in my mind for some reason. We're at difficulty epoch 323. Uh, a nice, I forget what it's called. It's the same backwards and forwards. Uh, and so the last difficulty adjustment was over the weekend. It was 11.3% upwards. Uh, blocks were coming in around 9 minutes and 18 seconds during the last epoch. Currently, we are scheduled to have another retarget on October 3rd so that is uh, nine days from now uh, right now it's estimated to be a downward difficulty adjustment of 1.3 percent and blocks are currently coming in around 10 minutes and 10 seconds 
obviously we are not too far into this difficulty epoch so that is subject to change we will keep you freaks updated obviously uh, fees we're looking at pretty low still getting that one sat fee in uh, actually they have raised since last week if you're ready to if you need to get your transaction confirmed the next block you should be sending a transaction with a 75 sat per byte fee if you're willing to wait an hour it drops down to 62 sats per byte if you're willing to wait a day that drops all the way down to two sats per byte last week it was one sat per byte so uh that that so that last time we're ever going to see one sat per byte that time preference is rising and yeah if you're if you're willing to wait a week you can get it in for one sat per byte we had a until you won't be able to yes we had a material increase in the unspent capacity on was uh excuse me samurai last week 1633.04 bitcoin i believe we were at around 1500 yeah. last first time we broke 1600 we were at 1500 on september 10th mm-hmm. uh, so that's a i like calling it we're calling it liquidity pool now that's what all the kids that's what all the kids like okay the liquidity pool has increased uh there's been 9769 cycles in the last 30 days <coughs> Uh, right now, 20.7% of all Bitcoin nodes that are reachable are version 0.20.0. Version 0.20.1 is catching up at 15.8%. Uh, and then behind that, uh, we have version 19.1, version 0.19.1, version 0.18.1, and version 0.18.0. I'm rounding that out. We see those updates happening more frequently now that people... Now there's more people running these like node packages on these single board computers like the Raspi's and stuff. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Because I right. feel like the updating is easier. Right. It's like more, I don't know, they're updating other things, so they update Bitcoin at the same time. Yeah, it's less manual, too. Yeah, which could be a good or a bad thing. Yeah, depending on your, your risk appetite for your node software. Uh, so that's the stats. Any other stats you want to look at today? Anything interesting I'm going to look around? Uh, I guess from like the thought of if you're running it that way, you're less likely to be actually keeping your keys hot. You're just using Bitcoin Core as a, or Bitcoin D as a way to look up your balances on your hardware wallet or something. Then updating it isn't as, you know, updating it frequently isn't as much of a risk because you're not worried about coin loss or not worried nearly as much about coin loss. No. But at some point, you're going to have to move those. But you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, if you're storing your Bitcoin hot in Bitcoin Core, uh, and every time you update, it could be a possibility that you lose your coins. Like, you actually get them stolen from you. But if, you, but if you're just using Bitcoin, you know, as a, if you're just using Bitcoin D or Bitcoin Core to look up your balances and not actually store your keys then, you know, maybe you have, like, some kind of consensus bug or failure or something, but you don't actually lose your funds. Yeah, if you're using it as a watch only. That makes a lot of yeah, sense. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so be aware, freaks. Uh, this episode of Rabbit Hole Recap is brought to you by good friends the motherfucking Cash Up. They're helping you stack sats, send sats, receive sats, and sell sats if you so please. We're saying sats, 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 sats because sats are the standard, all right? We're not buying fractions of Bitcoins. We're stacking whole sats. Uh, on top of this, you can stack slivers of stonks if you so please. Stonk market been getting crushed. If you're looking to buy that dip, um, not personally, you can. Uh, and again, if you're buying the dip, you don't have to stack a whole stonk. You can buy a sliver of a stonk as little as $1 because all this is connected to your bank account. There's no four to five day waiting periods. You can start uh, stacking sats today or slivers of stonks if you so please. Uh, Cash App Investing is a subsidiary of Square. Remember SIPC. As always, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's S T A C K I N G S S A T S. You're going to get $10, and $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. My dad taught me this, this week. Woo hoo! Woo! Woo hoo! Woo! And Marty's Owl made me aware that that's what horny owls say so there's a horny owl on my block uh download the cash app use the code stacking sats and then go check out our good friends at unchained capital huge announcement this week uh unchained capital is creating 
financial services for Bitcoiners with a security first mindset. They're trying to stay true to Bitcoin's ethos. And uh, this was not in the ad read, but I'm adding it to the ad read this week. They uh, released a business uh, application for businesses who want to engage in multi sig custody uh, with Unchained and have granular control over who has access to keys, who can. Uh, construct transactions, who can broadcast transactions, who can sign transactions, who can see uh, balances in wallets. So if you're a business who's looking to take self-custody of their Bitcoin uh, and do that in a multi-sig fashion, Unchained is building out a business tool suite for you. Very cool. On top of that, they have their concierge service, their white glove concierge service. If you're out there uh, and you uh, want to go from zero to multi-sig unchained has a $1,500 package. If you guys use the code TFTC, if you tell them we sent you, you're going to get $50 off. $1,500 package includes $1,450 for you freaks, Uh, includes uh, one-on-one Skype calls to go over what multi-sig is, to teach you how to use it, to answer any questions you may have. They're going to send you hardware wallets if you need them. And then on top of that, they're going to put $1,000 into your vault once you uh, set that up. Again, they're going to have multiple calls with you. They're going to get you as comfortable as possible and as you need to be before you set up your vault. They're going to help you set it up. They're going to send you the hardware wallets. They're really going to walk you through this. Uh, so go check them out at www.unchained-capital.com. That's www.unchained-capital.com. We'll, we'll put a link in the show notes to the concierge white glove service. And on top of that, they have an OTC desk that is adding more states by the week. Does that say Skype in the ad read? I didn't say... No, I mean, I don't think it says Skype. They don't use Skype. No, they don't use Skype. It's a video conference. I think it might be proprietary, actually. No, I think... Don't they use Google Meet? They may. I don't know for sure. Uh, I don't have the... triggered by Skype. Who uses Skype now? Skype's like a verb for me. Um, yeah, that's what I figured. And then the other thing is that advanced multi-sig for business, we actually have that in the list. I don't know if you realized. Mm-hmm. Um, I do. That, uh, that's, you know, I, I, I think that's a big deal. Like this is, uh, they're, they're going for, and, and I guess, I mean, we're just like continuing it here from the ad read, but. Disclosure, they're a sponsor of the podcast. I think this was a big deal to begin with, regardless of the ad read. Uh, they, they're they basically targeting like the Michael Saylors of the world, right? Instead of... So, so last week we mentioned, or I maybe alluded to the fact that I I, I thought that maybe they'd be self-custodying based on the way he, he spoke about it on Twitter. They are not self-custodying. They are keeping with a major custodian. I can't say the name um but they are keeping it with a major custodian it has come to my attention so this idea is basically a way to try and appeal to those types of companies instead of them using a custodian maybe they'll come and and do multi-sig where where unchained maybe holds a key maybe another institution also holds a key maybe neither of them holds a key but like they have this whole setup process for you yeah and it was funny that they dropped this product this week, considering the uh, the conversation that ensued in that thread where you corrected yourselves about their custody. It was a really good conversation. Who uh, was part of that? Rodolfo, Parker, Phil Geiger, Justin Moon, Jeff Andrew hopped in and just discussing the trade offs of that was self, a great thread. Yeah, of self custody for um, corporate entities, and it's interesting. Publicly traded companies with big boards and more decision makers uh, along the hierarchy i guess you could say it may be a little bit more difficult for them but small businesses that own and don't have own their whole operations and their own stack and don't have to answer to any boards may have may have it better off and an easier way to self-custody i mean absolutely it's definitely more difficult in a public company environment yeah um but no like i think rodolfo and Jeff Vandrew specifically hi- highlighted some some pain points for for the publicly traded companies, particularly like, can you trust the employees? How will you ever get past the board? You need to get the risk of the Bitcoin custody outside of your company because it's maybe too risky like of a, an activity. You need, to, you need to focus on your core competency as a business. I think I forget who it was, but someone was like. Rather than protect the keys, you just want someone to sue. Yes. 
but I think it's a little bit different in the Bitcoin land because it's so hard to get real insurance. Um, like we see like like the prime trusts of the world and the Coinbase's of the world and the Gemini's, they get like some kind of insurance. It's like 1% it's, of their hot wallets or something like that. Yeah, it's it's got so much fine print there. And uh, like insurance companies, like are, they're just known to just fuck you at every fucking turn, even in like non-Bitcoin kind of things. So it's really just a veiled protect. Like it gives you like some kind of plausible deniability that it wasn't your fault that, that Bitcoin gets lost. But but if one of these major custodians has like some kind of major hack or or bug and a good, serious amount of coin loss, like they're going out of business, and you're not gonna. I don't think you're gonna get that much if you sue them. Like I I don't know what you're gonna get pennies. Yeah, and Parker highlighted in that thread, counterparty risk exists. It was proven out with AIG. Um, it's yeah, and again, it's it's it depends on your risk appetite, your comf- your state of is comfortability a word? Your comfort, your comfort with uh, holding it with a, a another custodian, like is if they just up and run away with your Bitcoin, are you gonna be okay with that? And obviously. You have to be four hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin, man. Right. I think that's what you said. Like, is that do you want to trust that with somebody else? Four hundred million. Right. Someone was like, so no, someone was like, would you would you trust yourself with four hundred million dollars worth of big uh, keys for Bitcoin? I was like, I would you. I was like, would you trust someone else with four hundred million dollars worth <laughs> of your Bitcoin? Like I like no. Especially if that four hundred million can turn into four billion pretty quickly here. Yeah, especially if that's the fucking thesis. Right. It's yeah. one thing if your thesis is like, oh, it's just going to be stable and it's not going to go up. Yeah. Trade-offs. And hey, this is uh, some uncharted territory that Bitcoin is venturing into. And uh, these conversations need to begin to happen. And uh, it'll be interesting to see who pioneers these corporate structure key custody practices. So we have Unchained Capital, obviously. Uh, another person who hopped in that thread actually with some very good points was our, was our friend Thib from Knox Custody. They do similar stuff um, for companies uh, via Knox Custody. They will help set up multi-sig and, and be a key signer in those quorums as well too. Um, so yeah, these service providers are coming to market. It'll be interesting to see how popular The other thing is like you can do a multi-sig. Sorry for cutting you off, Marty. You're good. You can do a multi-sig where the providers have more keys than you, you know, where, where like unchained capital or Knox or like a a combination of a bunch of institutions, let's say like four, like let's say that it's a five key setup and four of the keys are held by outside institutions and you'll hold one key. Like at least you have more audibility, right? Like, you know, you know the funds aren't being rehypothecated. You know they're actually there. That they that they that they're. It's a nice proof of proof of funds, proof of custody. Yeah, that was another thing that was brought up in that that thread, like giving keys to multiple institutions. Which still, to me, I'm dumb. I'm like trying to figure out how and why that would work and how you'd be able to trust everybody in that quorum. You don't have to. That's the beauty of it. You just have to trust that like three or five of them don't fuck you. Yeah, it's still it's still it it's still superior, obviously, from a trust model than if you just have a single custodian. And it's only possible because of Bitcoin. And you can put you can put each each of those key signers can be in like different jurisdictions. You know, you can have like a Singaporean bank. You can have a German bank. You can have a U.S. bank. You know, you can have some like lawyer in the Caymans and then like you control a key. I like that. See that You can do like crazy fucking shit. Right. Ooh, it's exciting. On the cutting edge here. Uh, yeah, and I, I think this subject is going to be more and more prominent as companies like MicroStrategy, Snappa, Tahini. Uh, then, what was I forget t- Tahini. Um, what's the name of that company? It's Tahini's, right? Tahini's, yeah. Uh, I think they listen yeah. to the show. Shout out to Tahini's. And, Tahini's, uh, Tahini's restaurant in Ontario. I, next time I'm in in Ontario, I'm gonna definitely I'm gonna definitely go try. It. I love I love me some gyro and some falafel. It's, uh, I'm a sucker for the for the uh, chicken shawarma. 
Yeah, shawarma, huge fan. Um, the other thing with Unchained is you can even go crazier because they, they have their shamirs set up too. So then you could take one of those keys and you could shamir the fuck out of it. And you can and you can basically make it so you need a threshold to activate that single key in the first place. Yeah. So like if you're listening and you're running like a major business that's considering, you know, allocating a portion of, to Bitcoin, I'm not saying like I'm not saying to Michael Saylor like he should put his whole four hundred million in. You know, but these are things you should explore and at least maybe consider it for his personal stash. I assume I assume the guy bought some before he bought it with his company. Um, but you know, this, this is something you dip your toes in, you get used to, but it, it, it seems strictly superior to me in the, in the long term. Yeah. What is the strategy for a $425 million custody? Do you break it up in multiple different hardware or excuse me, um, HD wallets, as many UT, like how many UTXOs do you break that up into? Like how many private keys do you break that you into? You do like one UTXO per wallet, first of all, because obviously there's no privacy. No, you're not. The privacy isn't a goal. It's a publicly traded company, right? So you're gonna have to. Everything's gonna have to be disclosed and super, on the up and up. Anyway, but yeah, you split it up based on your risk profile, right? But I mean, I would split it up into at least like a hundred million dollar chunks. It just feels good, <laughs> right? Like why a, a hard asset to insure that's like pretty nascent. Like why? I mean, you got to realize there's not. How many different methods of storing it do you trust, right? But you can set it up into, uh, you know, three or four different uh, wallets in, in, that are all secured in, in slightly different ways so that you're not all in one one basket. Right now, the, it, the single custodian, something happens to them. Um, I mean, and, and I'm saying this partially from a greed point of view because if Marty loses his keys, like, you know... Like Bitcoin is 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 completely fine. No one's gonna care. If me or Marty lose our keys. Like no one's gonna care. Everyone's Bitcoin becomes slightly more valuable. But there's like a couple custodians that no one talks about that they do like they're they're doing the wallets for like all the major exchanges and like all the major players. And if something happens there, like Bitcoin will be fine long term. And especially if the funds are lost forever, then yeah, like all of our Bitcoin becomes worth some more. But there's it's going to be tur- turbulent times. Like a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money, and it's going to be fucking chaos. If, yeah. if there's like a couple you could hit, that it would just be it would be pretty bad. Considerably worse than Gox, I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Gox was such a big part, though, right? Gox was the exchange. Well, so maybe not. Well, the custodians that you're. Uh, referring to are a big part just under the radar behind the scenes uh, it would be more apparent of how integral they are to the exchange yeah. infrastructure um, but know the risk know the trade-offs know the uh, optionality that you have freaks especially if you're running a business and explore this is that's the beauty of bitcoin uh, there's so much to be built out so much to experiment with and uh, so many ways in which this can go. Uh, it's just like infinitely fascinating to play out the game theory like we did just there. Let's get to shout outs. Matt, I'm sorry about this first shout out. Love you, Marty. You're the best. This is only for you. Fuck you, Matt. I don't know who wrote that. Love you, freak. Anonymous. I, I love pre- appreciate you. I love you, Matt. Uh, Marty and Matt. To, they're trying to cause strife between us yes yes that's what uh that's what i warned matt before somebody tried to divide us we will not be divided freaks no matter how hard you fucking try uh (laughs) second and last shout out of the week a good one marty and matt y'all don't know me but you should know this i will not eat bugs i will not live in a pod i will not follow to spotify here's fifty dollars to ensure i'm not tempted thanks for your work (laughs) and as long as i have the mic dear freaks few of you know me but Let's divine collabor- collaborativism. I've been like working on this and I fucked it up. Collaborativism. Uh, type it out. C O L L A B O R A T I V I S M. Notice the red underline? If collaboration is working together, especially in a joint intellectual effort, then collaborativism is a model 
by which sufficiently well-coordinated entities behaving self-interestedly work towards a particular goal. It's neither collectivism or communism. It's depolarizing. It's a single memorable word. It's not hard to say, though. This is my input. Uh, a meme brought into this world competing for survival. If you like it, spread it. Tell your friends. Bitcoin is our means. Collaborativism is our model. The goals are peace, love, unity, and respect. Use Bitcoin. Obviate the state. Let's fucking go. Kiss face up. Uh, real. F- this is from real uh, at real fake Bitcoin. Uh, P.S. It's a cult. Hail Eris. <laughs> <laughs> um, Collaborativism. Collaborativism. I think well, that's first it. off. Like. I like I, I love you, freak. But I, I promise you, we're never going to go Spotify exclusive. But I, I don't think I don't think that collaborativism is ever going to stick. It's too hard to say. It's very Can hard you to just say. say it right. I think I think so. I don't know. Collaborativism. Collaborativism. Never, never going to stick. We need, it needs to be easy to say. Yes, and you're talking to a me master uh, across from me right now. Yes, and I can assure you, we're not going to go to Spotify. They've already tried to coax us over. Uh, you should not, see the deal they offered us. It was yeah, massive. Yeah. We uh, we left a lot of money on the table for you freaks. But like 25 what, million Bitcoin. So, they were going to give us more than the existing supply of Bitcoin. Yeah, they were just getting into the Bitcoin space. They, Take that, Joe. <laughs> Joe doesn't even know what he's missing out on in the Bitcoin payouts. Uh, no, but with that being said, only I think only like 5% of you freaks listen via Spotify. I think 50% listen via android devices uh, and android apps um i know you can get spotify on android devices android specific apps we would not leave you in the dust and we would not expect you to follow either if we went to spotify it is known yes uh thank you for listening if you are here no matter what and the the person who did the the jack mahler's uh shout out hasn't reached out yet for what it's worth he has not. Or We're she. not saying who the if 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 you're the freak, you don't have to dox yourself to us. You know, you can do it through some private medium if you want. You can hit us on Keybase or or something like that, or like create a fake Twitter and hit us that way. Yeah, or a fake email address yeah. at Marty's or Marty's Bent at Gmail dot com. There you go. Sign him up for all the newsletters. Please don't. Uh, please don't. Please. Uh, <laughs> why'd you Why'd you accept that idea? I don't know. You 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 blasted the email address. That's what happens. American Auto is gonna be blasting me on porn fucking newsletters now. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Uh, <laughs> this uh, I don't want to say controversial, but this uh, sparked Sign some comment for the ETH. Sign him up for all the ETH <laughs> newsletters. Oh Get God. Him his DeFi news. God damn it. Um, <laughs> Sorry. This caused some conversation earlier this week. I. Yost, Yost Yager, I hope I'm pronouncing his Jost Yager uh, is probably how you pronounce it from the Netherlands. Uh, he left Lightning Labs uh, earlier this week and then um, announced a project that he's working on, Firewall Circuit Breaker for Lightning uh, nodes, and basically he highlighted a griefing attack that is uh, p- possible uh, where you basically uh, sent, what is it, 43 transit 43 transactions it's, can lock up the htlcs it's basically a, a it's a ddos it's yes. a denial of service uh but with lightning you just send like a lot of small payments right and but you like hold them right and you don't actually send them through yeah you basically stuff up the htlcs in some way so you take many routes to the same and and uh, end node and sort of lock the node up and the funds. Uh, they can't steal the funds, but they can make it so you can't send them for an extended period of time. But it seems that that's what, what I liked about his thread is well. Before we get to his thread, number one, this yeah. Is, so you is send you, you're you're sending them to yourself, right? You control nodes on both sides of the node you're attacking, and you send the payment to yourself by doing like an invoice, but you never actually fucking send the payment so it doesn't even cost you any fees to do the attack yeah yeah exactly and so it's a griefing attack at ddos um it's been well known 
uh, among the lightning community for a while, and there have been um, uh, resolution solutions proposed, and Joost is proposing Circuit Breaker, which basically allows you to uh, set a limit on the amount of uh, HDLCs that can be in, in route at, at any given point in time. And again, it's not 43, it's 483 HDLCs. Uh, the current maximum HTLC slots is 483, so they can, um, a, theoretically, an attacker could uh, clog those up and, and prevent you from sending funds. Circuit Breaker would limit the amount of in-route HTLCs uh, at any given point in time, so it mitigates that risk. So we're it's 483 HTLCs, but because there can be up to... Because you can split up your payments, right? Because you can just keep adding hops, you might only be able. You might only require fifty-four payments to do it. Yes, because it gets split up into. Um, the point is, the attack is very cheap to do and easy. Yes. Right. Yes. And 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 the idea is, you would hit, I guess, large routing nodes. For either two reasons, I I mean, I guess three reasons, either because you hate Bitcoin and you just want to like piss people off. Uh, the second reason is if you're competing with another routing node for fees, right? Let's say you're LN big and you're making a lot of fees and you knock bit refill off. So then the, the, the actual payments come to you and you take the fees. Um, I don't think lightning fees are that high enough really for that to be a thing, but it could be presumably in the future. And then maybe surveillance. Like if you know, uh, if 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 you know that if you're trying to surveil a particular node, then maybe cutting off certain you get kind of can choose where the route goes. If you cut off if you cut off certain nodes from them. Yeah, and another way this this attack can be mitigated is private channels opened up between counterparties that you trust. Well, because they can't use private channels. Strangers can't use private channels. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so be aware. It was interesting. Uh, if you are interested in the Lightning Network and make it more robust and less susceptible to these types of attacks. Uh, Joe's has started a GitHub page, github.com slash lightning equipment slash circuit breaker. Obviously we will link to that in the show notes. If you're a developer working on lightning, interested in this, why don't you give it some review feedback, whatever you think is necessary in this context. I am too dumb to offer any of those. One of the interesting things here is, I, I I and correct me if I'm wrong in the in the tweets freaks, but I, I think this is on a per channel basis. So it's actually could be a negative of having big ass wombo channels. Right? Like if no, you have That's what he calls the, out specifically in the thread, yeah. The yeah, channels. the cost is a lot cheaper if it's if you have five I mean the cost it costs a lot more if you have five one Bitcoin channels than if you have one five Bitcoin channel. Yeah. And I guess the effect of the attack is better, is larger on Wombo channels than right. smaller channels. If you channels. can hit like yeah. a mass, you hit like a massive channel between BitRefill and Bitfinex, and you can cause all sorts of 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 issues if if on the network as a whole, yes. rather than if you if there was like a bunch of little channels, they're going to all different places. So if you're opening up Wombo channels, maybe do it privately with people that you trust. Uh, this has been making the rounds. Iran power plants, Iranian power plants, uh, plan to sell electricity to Bitcoin miners. It says crypto miners, but I imagine they'll I be. I think per- that's like mostly Bitcoin miners. Yeah, predominantly mining Bitcoin. So thermal power plant holding company, uh, which owns and operates a bunch of plants across Iran, uh, said Bitcoin miners are now able to buy electricity f- from three of its power stations. And this is according to the Tehran Times, and this is being uh, doubly reported by Patty Baker at CoinDesk. So it'll be interesting to see um, what the, the price per kilowatt hour that's being offered to the, these miners, uh, whether or not they have to uh, register with the government, which I assume they will have to if they don't already. And They what, do. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I thought was interesting with this article is that and there's like no way for us to easily verify it. Uh, the Iranians know better than us, and and you have to kind of take their word for it. 
um, their share of Bitcoin mining output is 4% now, which seems like way higher than you, than most people I think would expect. No, I think, yeah, that's been pretty, pretty well. well. They said it's double percentage is double from September, 2019. Yeah. Yeah. So they went from two to four, which is a pretty big jump. Yeah. And with this, um, I mean the, the power plants that are being made available to Bitcoin miners have an available capacity of, uh, 5,485 megawatts, which is pretty considerable. That would be a huge chunk of, uh, the hash rate today. If they were to consume all that with Bitcoin mining, we'll see you know, what percentage of that total available megawatt hours gets consumed by Bitcoin miners. Um, but yeah, be on the lookout, uh, for that. And that actually something that's not on the list and I have not gone into detail yet. Uh, I've not read, uh, yet. I haven't had time today, but the Cambridge, um, uh, what's the, the full name of this? The Cambridge judge business school, uh, they released their annual report, uh, about a bunch of, uh, data in the Bitcoin world, their third global crypto asset, uh, benchmark report, shout out to Appleine, Blandin, uh, Dr. Gina Peters, Yu Wu, uh, I gotta hit accept cookies here, Thomas Esserman, Anton Deck, Sean Taylor, and Damar Nojiki. Uh, I have not read the report, but I've seen a lot of people tweeting about it. Uh, and they're saying, according to them, I got to dive in. I saw Nick Carter tweeting about this 39% of Bitcoin mining is renewable energy, is being sourced by renewable or powered by renewable energy. And that's down considerably. Uh, from what CoinShares estimated only a couple of years ago. Uh, on top of that, I believe they increased their estimate of total Bitcoin holders in the world to 101 million people. And I, I believe it was something like 39 million people last year. So that, if true, uh, is a significant increase in Bitcoin holders around the Wait, world. who's reporting this? The, uh, the Cambridge Judge, University of Cambridge. 100 million seems really high, right? I don't know, man. That's why. I, let me find Nick's tweet here because that's where I'm pulling. I, again, I had to read the report. I haven't t- had time to dive into and, it. And the renewable energy is worse now. The less renewables are being used percentage wise, right? Yes, I believe so. Um, Do you think that's partially uh, because of flared gas? Uh, no, I don't think the flared gas because mining historically here. it's it's the hydro. Hydro yeah. is the main power source, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think that's been getting priced out in recent years. Um, it's been getting more expensive in China. Um, again, I got to jump into the report. I just want to make you freaks aware of it. Maybe we'll dive into it in more detail yesterday. But yeah, Nick tweeted out, they estimate the number of crypto asset users uh, worldwide is at 101 million, up from 35 million to 2018. Oh. So not for crypto. last year. Crypto asset. Yeah, I can see that. That makes more sense to me. Why would that make more sense? Like, don't you think be, people would you have? You think there's people that own shit coins that are not Bitcoin? No. Do you? What about like security tokens and shit? Because that I don't. I mean, how many security tokens are there? I don't know. There might be people that just own like Tether. They yeah, just I, own. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. There's yeah. probably at least some people that only hold ETH. They're probably a strong minority, but they're like there's this new breed of like really crazy ETH heads that are only ETH. God bless the you. OG, the OG shit corners always held the majority of their funds in Bitcoin. Yes. And good luck if you're holding a majority of your funds in <laughs> Ethereum. Ooh, we didn't have that on the list. What'd you think of the uh, the few controversy? Did you follow so that? My at guess all? is like thirty to thirty to fifty million Bitcoiners. And most of them you know, if you go back to the Clark Moody episode, they aren't real Bitcoiners because they're not controlling their own keys. They're not uh, real Bitcoiners because they don't eat meat. A lot of them. <laughs> they're not real Bitcoiners because they're not using their own node. Yeah. Um, the few stuff is, is uh, I mean, fuck them, right? I think it's just hilarious. The, the sanctimonious backpedaling. It was just a joke. And so... If it was just a joke, I posit, what would you have done if those screenshots weren't leaked? 
Wait, so explain it to the freaks, because uh, you know if if they're a smart freak, they're not aware of any of this. Yeah. So DeFi Land had a a bit of a controversy this week. Some screenshots leaked from a personal chat of fifty people, and in the the chat room of fifty people, they were uh, conspiring to launch a DeFi token known as Few. Uh, it was like fifty like semi prominent Twitter ETH Twitterati, you know, yeah. like uh, yes. Um, and so they were planning on uh, spinning this token up, distributing supply amongst each other, launching it on Uniswap, I imagine, uh, getting it launched on Uniswap, having it trade. Pre-mining. And then, yeah, pre-mining and dumping. Uh, screenshots leaked of the conversation in which some of the uh, quote-unquote influencers were talking about dumping uh, on retail or people who will come to this token after them and uh, Literally said, like, don't invite too many people. We need people to dump on. Yes, exactly. Uh, and even alluding to previous uh, inside insider trading action with other tokens. Uh, and so the screenshots leaked. A lot of drama on Twitter and the people involved came out and said, oh, it was all a joke. It was all a joke. But again, I pause it. If it was, were all a joke and those screenshots, what, what would happen if those screenshots were never leaked? Would, would few token be floating right now? Would... Would you have made money from it? I would imagine so. I mean, one of the people involved wrote like, like a ten ten tweet thread, make culpa, like apologizing about it. So didn't sound like much of a joke there, right? Um, you know, I think we've talked about it on this pod a bunch of times. Like, like reputation is a long game, and especially in this space, if you lose it, like there should be no forgiveness. Like you lose that for good. Um, and in, in particular in the, in the world of illiquid shit tokens, um, there's a lot of room to be unethical and make a lot of money. You can make a lot of fucking money and people have in the past. Many people have people are right easier to make money that way than trying making it ethically. Um, so, you know, if you think that's wrong, like you need to, you need to keep calling them out because yes. especially in the bull runs, it gets fucking horrible. Agre- like this egregious. Is yeah. Yeah. This is, this is not the first time something like this has happened. This is like basically the, the story of shit coins. This is the history yeah. of, of shit coins existence. You can go back to Bitcoin or go, go through. That's uh, crazy how the, evolution of these shit queen launches pre mines has evolved because remember it was like back in the day it was like proof of work launch or nothing and then well look, look at you know if you want to be really provocative about it um few is just a more illiquid less successful version of eth like yes like yes. eth was like what they had like their 20 people you know maybe they weren't in a chat room they were like in a in a bar in like outside of bitcoin miami but like that, like that's it's. There's the same idea. It's like let's we'll we'll take the full pre mine. We can sell some to the public, and then we'll fucking pump the shit out of this thing. World computer. World computer. It's going to version 2.0. Maybe they're already talking about 3.0. But hey, that narrative is always going to be that. There's always a new narrative carrot on a stick that you guys can follow. DeFi is the current narrative, uh, and in this case particularly, it seems that DeFi is a bunch of assholes just trying to screw retail which is what i've assumed it has been up to up to this point uh actually have an episode dropping tomorrow look out for it with matthew black from atomic loans uh soon to be atomic finance they're moving off ethereum and he talked about the uh the stress that comes with building on ethereum and then the the allure like they were they were getting pressured to spin up a token he just at uh, consciously couldn't do it um and so i think it's a very interesting perspective on the state of ethereum the intentions of that project and the tokens being spun up on on top of it particularly um very smart kid is 22 whipper smart fucking i'm uh i'm very bullish on the use matt very bullish on the use awesome looking forward to giving a listen i'm bullish on the idea of uh so what are they like born again bitcoiners? Like what? they've always been bitcoiners, but they wanted to build a non-custodial. No, but the idea that like if someone has a project built on Ethereum and then they they decide to leave Ethereum and then they come on tails to the crypt. 
Yes. Like I, I would like if that became a stereotype. If you're out there and you're thinking about it, <laughs> our lines are open. Uh, no, and this like, so this is another thing like Bitcoin Twitter or crypto Twitter, I guess. It's not really focused on Bitcoin Twitter. The traders, they'll like, they'll make fun of you for being poor and yell at you for not making money. Uh, but at the end of the day, they don't care about any of this shit. They only care about is making money. They're not going to hold wifey or tendies for the next 30 years where I can say pretty confidently that most Bitcoiners are in this for, for the longer term. And yeah, uh, but no one is admitting, no, there's, I, I mean, I don't think you think there's like a, there might be like some small, tiny subsect that thinks Yiffy or whatever is going to last 30 years. But I, I think at least the overwhelming majority of people that are involved there know it's bullshit, right? Like they, they know yes. it's not like five years, more than five years. It's not more than like five months usually. Yeah. I was being conservative. Yeah. Be aware. Signal over noise. Bringing it to you here at Tales Stay from the Crypt. Stay on the stack That is true. It's the ultimate TLDR. Yes. Uh, um, good friends at Hashrate. Hashrate. hashr dot com put out a blog this week uh, about the internal struggles of Bitmain. They particularly put it on a timeline uh, so John Quigley, John Lee Quigley from Hashrate, uh, did a very comprehensive timeline of the Bitmain saga. It's been, uh, some of the juiciest drama in the Bitcoin world to date. I've said, uh, on this podcast many times that I believe Bitmain will go down as the Icarus story of early Bitcoin. They had a lot of potential to dominate the Bitcoin mining market in particular, and they squandered it, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, uh, in a pretty grandiose way. Is there anything on this timeline that stuck out to you, Matt? No, it's just a really good, well done timeline. So, um, fuck Bitmain. Very interesting story. And if you weren't here for it, you should go check out the timeline. Cause he goes all the way back to 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause like to me, like, I mean, 2017, they were the juggernaut in the room, man. They were the juggernaut. They went balls to the wall and you know it was a successful strategy for them for a while but but it didn't it didn't work out and and most important i mean from my perspective the big thing was the was the bitcoin cash bet and it was just almost like they they went with the gamble every single time and then when the time came like when the time came when they when they needed to commit to Bitcoin Cash and like go Bitcoin Cash over over the real Bitcoin, they uh, they, yeah they they just bitched out, and then yeah. that was the end of that. Yeah, and the uh, writing was on the wall at that point on. You know what? Good riddance. Good riddance. Good riddance. Uh, Amen. The uh, Amplied alone should be enough to piss people off. The fact that they they had a back door that could shut down their miners remotely if they wanted to. Uh, whether or not that was exploited, I don't think that ever. It wasn't. Has been, yeah. Or at least, and no one even accused them of exploiting it. So. Yeah. Um, but then, there's arguments they held up. Segwit because of ASIC boosts, covert ASIC boosts specifically. Um, so. They definitely were mining on their own chips before they were shipping them out. Yeah, that as well. Quality control testing. <laughs> Um, so good riddance. A we'll do software update dive right here in the middle of this just to get it uh, over with. Bisk version one point three point nine has been released, and I, I know Bisk has made it a point to to make Marty um, Marty uh, friendly release notes. So uh, here they are. This release brings auto confirmation for Monero trades, makes usernames required for revault payments to reduce disputes based on mediator feedback and improves connectivity within the network and also improves reliability. Please update to this version to avoid network issues. That's what they're asking. Thank you for the Marty friendly release notes there. Uh, Blue Wallet version 5.5.9 has been released. A uh, bunch of fixes in there. Not going to read every release note of all these updates. Somebody actually. <laughs> the Did... big the big thing for Blue Wallet was uh, the UI around fees is much better. Yeah, this update we should talk about because actually a freak reached out to me in DMs. I don't know if he reached out to you as well. Or actually, no, I got an email about this over the weekend. Uh, a response to the Sat standard Tails version four point one one is out. 
um, and apparently there's some important updates in this Tales uh, the tour has been updated Thunderbird's been updated and I believe they did something with Electrum as well let me pull up yeah the they brought Electrum up so that um, I think it was Trezor uh, but it, they, they brought it up to the most recent Electrum release which is a big deal yeah, let me um, let me see if I have it here let me find this email to make sure I didn't miss anything. But it, it was definitely, yeah, yeah. The the Treasure Model T is supported again on Electrum. Okay. Uh, oh, it was it it was an Electrum update. The last the last Tales brought Electrum up to V four point zero point two. It was Treasure's Python driver. So yes. that so that you don't have to separately install the driver, you can just like boot up Tails and plug in the treasure. Yes, that is. Uh, Which is fucking key. Like you don't want like the whole beauty of Tails is that it's like all built in and like ready to go. Like you don't want to have to and like every every time it's it's amnesiac, so it, it loses all of its settings when you when you pull the drive out of it. Yeah. So you don't want to have to reinstall the driver every time. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, here's the message from the freak before version 4.11. There were several steps a privacy freak had to make to take uh, to make the setup work. As of 4.11, all support is built in and asterisk, between asterisks just works. Tails is hugely resistant to malware, hacking, tracking, etc. As I'm sure you're aware, and this makes it a natural place to securely access your wallet coupled with the secure storage of the treasure. Yeah, we love Tails here, and it's uh, got Electrum built in. Yes. And everything defaults through Tor. Yes. Um, we... Even though now I am purely a Spectre maximalist. Ooh. And I just, I'm fucking loving the Bitcoin Core f- plus Spectre combination. Should we just jump to the smart card support for Spectre? This looks well, so cool. Well, we have cool. The, the next software update is Spectre, right? Uh, it's Next Bitcoin is the next one. Oh, there you go. Well, we got Nick's Bitcoin has been updated. Version zero point zero point one seven. The big thing for that is is that they made being a joint market maker much easier, uh, which is this, which is when you run joint market server with constant liquidity and and you're able to to make make fees off of that by providing liquidity. Um, so that's really good to see. I mean, they, they're joining Raspi Blitz and trying to make that process easier for people. Um, and I, the the way Raspi Blitz does it with Join Inbox is fucking fantastic. I haven't tried it with Nick's Bitcoin yet, but it's fantastic to see. Then Spectre V zero point eight point zero has been released, um, and I guess they made some changes with the Prune node. They made some changes with how the UI is displaying. Um, the UI is more mobile friendly. The QR codes can be resized. There's this new wallet setup wizard when you're setting up just a single sig wallet with like cold card or ledger or treasure or something or or their do your own hardware wallet where it like brings you through the wizard to make it as like easy as possible. And th- this is what I'm really bullish on. Like I feel like we're getting to the point where it's going to be almost as easy if not easier to to have Spectre installed, have Bitcoin Core installed, even Prune Mode, fine, and then just use your hardware wallet with that instead of using Ledger Live or using you know wallet.treasure.io and leaking your addresses to their central server. So that's fucking huge. Shout out to the Spectre team. Uh, looking at those release notes right now, Ben Kaufman, uh, Stepan Snigarev, uh, and K9 Ert. Uh, and Michael Flaxman's in there as well, uh, really contributing. And Pulp Cattle and Moritz, uh, Dennis Raymond's in there. Shout out to all these people, Simone, working on uh, Spectre. It is really cool. And uh, again, I was alluding to it earlier, mentioned it earlier, right before Matt described the latest update, the, the smart card implementation looks really cool. Is that So what am I looking at there? I just sure. seen the video and I don't, completely understand it so specter is two parts we have we have specter the software uh application um that you run your computer alongside bitcoin core and that allows that that provides an interface between bitcoin core and your hardware wallets um where it gives you coin control labeling and all this great stuff that you that you'd want there and then we have their their own do-it-yourself hardware wallet that they're calling Spectre. And that costs about $100. It comes with all off-the-shelf parts 
and it's completely open source. Um, so this wallet is doesn't have a secure element though, right? So the idea is because it doesn't have a secure element, it doesn't remember any of your private keys. It's just as soon as it gets powered off, it it's it's supposed to completely wipe. Um, this is that's obviously not foolproof though, so it's actually really useful in a multi-sig setup where you have like a cold card, um, a treasure, and uh, and this this specter or a cold card and a ledger and the specter. Like you can use it as one of the keys, um, and you have the benefit of off-the-shelf parts and completely open source. Um, with this, you can keep the keys on a smart card that you insert in the back side of the device. Um, Where do you get these smart cards? It looks like a debit card. Like, How do you get these? Are these just freely available? I think you either insert or tap. It might be RFID. I'm not sure. Because he like, kind of puts it on the behind, right? Yeah, it looks RFID-ish. But he says insert on the tweet, right? Yes. Which is confusing. Yeah. But either way, like I think you can just buy the smart cards at like an electronic store or online. Yeah. And you can reprogram them. Mm-hmm. Like this is what like they use I mean if it's an RFID version, it's like what they use for hotel keys. Yeah. Maybe like slightly more secure secured up than like a hotel key. Uh but like are the those like those those thicker like RFID badges you see like when you're like entering an office building. Yeah, but so it- the smart card, each smart card is associated with a different private key, correct? Yeah. That's what it looked like. Yeah, it was really cool. It's um, like your seed is on the smart card. Yeah. But to sign it, you need the Spectre hardware. Well, you if you you can mix it with a passphrase that you enter yes. on, the, on the device, right? Yeah. So you, yeah. you scan the smart card, and then you enter the passphrase on the, on the device, and then you can sign. And if it's just one key of multiple keys, then you also have that advantage, right? Because then you're signing with that do, do-it-yourself device, and then you also still need to sign with the cold card or something. Yeah. Pretty dope. Shout, again, shout out to the Spectre team. You guys are putting out some dope software and hardware. Or you're not... You're allowing people to pick hardware off the shelf and build some pretty dope tools. I'm super bullish on it. I mean, I actually... It's funny, right? But like, they should. I think they should at least release a kit. If not, uh, if not just a pre-built, they can they can release a pre-built version too. I know Crypto Cloaks; they're working in partnership with Crypto Cloaks, who's going to release like a case for it as well, so you can make it more of a. I mean, like the question here, right? Is like I love the team. I love that it's completely open source. I think it's a fucking game changer of a product, both sides, on both the software and this do-it-yourself hardware. Um, the real concern is like, how can they? Can can they monetize and make this a sustainable thing so we get updates so it's you know, it stays, it stays top top of class you know if, if like people are storing a lot of money on it so we'll see we'll see where they go with this it looks like right now their goal is, is maybe like try and get the enterprise side to fund some of it or, um, at least small businesses maybe that that are looking for like a a non custodial way of storing funds but while still having tech support. Hey, grant grant issuers out there that may be listening to this, give give Spectre a look. Give the team at Spectre a look. Again, they're putting out some dope stuff. Speaking of dope stuff, uh, Samurai announced a couple hours ago the release of Dojo 1.8.0. Uh, and the tweet that came with that uh, announced that improvements that should result in better performance on low-spec devices updated to Bitcoin Core version 0.20.1. Uh, they consolidated three previous API endpoints into one and totally revamped the Dojo maintenance tool UI. And a couple of comments I saw in the um, in the replies to that tweet, uh, one from Bitcoin Q and A uh, was looks like the need for rescanning uh, X pubs using Dojo maintenance tool is unnecessary now, which is huge because that could be a, a cause for panic for some people who don't realize. When you recover a wallet, uh, or when you open a wallet and it's pulling uh, block headers, if it uses a prune node or whatever, it, it may look like there's no UTXOs in your wallet, but you just have to rescan it. And if you do that manually, uh, it can cause a panic. So if they're doing that automatically, yeah, no. they, like it'll show zero balance. Yeah, yeah. And people get scared like fucking hell. Yeah. Naturally, you know, take yeah. a deep breath. Rescan your wallet. 
if you ever see the zero it in looks there. like this is going to go a long way to solving that that particular issue and yeah. just like make that whole process easier and this is also very useful for the uncle jims of the world um because when when you add when you add someone onto your um like when when if someone if someone is using your dojo then you have to be tracking their xpub as well so to yes. make that process easier is uh is welcome yes so shout out to the samurai team for getting that out there the other thing in samurai land that isn't quite out but we've been i've been part of the group testing it um is they already have these two person coin joints um they they're calling them stonewall times two where you, where you have two people they do the coin joins uh and they have stowaway where if i pay you then we do a coin join together so like a pay join between the two of us um and right now that that uses a qr code for passing the the messages qr code or copy and paste uh so you can either like copy and paste it into like a secure messaging app uh like a signal or something or a wire or you can scan qr codes of you standing next to each other well they came up with a messaging layer for tor that is drop in and app agnostic and coin agnostic so it doesn't know that bitcoin is involved it doesn't know it's not samurai specific it's just a messaging layer for tor that allows two people to use uh tor to communicate with each other two devices uh in their implementation, they're using paynims to communicate with each other because they already have paynims uh, to, to pay each other. Um, but it, it isn't necessary. And the idea here is that within just a couple clicks through Tor, um, with not much user interaction, you'll be able to do a two-person coin join, whether that's that pay join model or whether it's just a like basically like a mini coin join round where you have two people do it. Um, and I think that's fucking huge, like especially if we could get that kind of any kind of cross app support it like it just starts killing heuristics and one of the nice things here is because there's not a there's no coordinator involved um the coordinator is not getting a fee um and 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 you're not um there, there's no you're not you're not coin joining with strangers so the the negative is you don't have to worry about any kind of Sybil attack. The positive is you don't have to worry about any kind of Sybil attacks because you're not coin joining with strangers. The The negative is that you do have to trust the person you're coin joining with because they obviously know which transaction is yours or which transaction is theirs. Um, but it, it could be extremely powerful um, at any kind of scale because it just completely breaks the heuristic of, uh, of, of both both inputs on the, on the input side are owned by the same person. Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. I'm really so, bullish on that. That should come out pretty soon. So you're beta testing that? Yeah, it's pretty fucking cool. And are you, are you doing that on the mobile app or are you using like a... No, a no, it's, it's all... They, they have like a testing mobile app. Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, it's it's it'll all just... It'll just be like in the mobile app. And the beauty is, is like every spend in Samurai after you do Whirlpool is a simulated two-person coin join. So it looks like... It, it's a two person coin join, but it's just one person doing it. So if we have more of these people doing real two person coin joins, then it completely breaks the heuristic. You don't know which one is a one person and which one's a two person. They look the same. So you, we don't even need that many people doing the two person. If we have like, you know, 3000 people, 4000 people doing the, the two person, like maybe that's enough to like completely break the heuristic. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the day when, uh, some, government agency attempts to uh use one of these heuristics to to prove that somebody committed what they deemed to be a crime and it, and it comes out that they were completely wrong and the owner of one of the uh inputs was somebody completely different than they expected is that what it will take to uh prove that these heuristics are i mean see like bunk? that's a problem with with like heuristic breaking uh, because like tracking Bitcoin is a probability game. Uh, so you, by breaking the heuristics, you reduce the probabilities, you reduce the likelihood that, that, that Bitcoin can be tracked. You, you make their guesses more, more, more guesses rather than educated. But the issue is, is like, 
governments have thrown plenty of people in jail for things they didn't do in the past. <laughs> you know, it's taken... It's, you know, the people have been put in jail for murdering someone for life. And like 25 years later, it like there's DNA evidence that absconds them and they get off. Like Kamala I'd, Harris. Yeah. Like I prefer if like, I don't know, you know, it could, it, they could throw people in jail for bad heuristics for a while. Yeah. Right. Before like it, it, it and if in some countries they may never admit that they were wrong. Yeah. So, <sighs> We'll it's an ongoing it, battle. It, it, it definitely would be interesting to have like some of these like chain surveillance companies like in court, like trying to make a case that, you know, this is this person. Because we haven't really seen that. We haven't. One of the things that's so sketchy about these firms is that everything they do is like behind closed doors. You don't get to see the tools. You don't get to see the analysis. You don't get to see what they're using. Yeah. And this highlights something you tweeted about today, you quote tweeted no bullshit Bitcoin and uh, making the world aware that uh, the Russian government wants full wallet disclosures addresses. Uh, if you own Bitcoin, uh, own enough Bitcoin in a single address that's worth more than $1,300, the Russian government wants its citizens to report those addresses to the government. And this highlights a single address. That's what Mr. Hoddle tried to say it was. I don't. Th- I I think it's a wallet that's over thirteen hundred. <laughs> like I think if they cluster your wallet, I don't think like if you're not reusing. If you're let's say you're not reusing addresses, so but you buy like. $2, once $2, the crypto $2. users to have to report their digital wallet address, transaction transaction history and balance, if the wallet receives more than a hundred thousand rubles, around thirteen hundred dollars. The wallet, not the address. It says the digital wallet address. But then it says the wallet. Well, the wallet address. I don't know, but the thing is, even if it's just specifically an address, like that loophole will last like what a year or so, right? And then they'll be like, they'll just see everyone like structuring their their addresses under thirteen hundred. <laughs> like they'll they'll have like a bunch of addresses that are twelve hundred, and they'll be like, okay, wallets, full wallets. Yeah, they're uh, they're also right? the distinction doesn't really matter because it's just it's just a matter of time. Yeah, and so anybody who fails to report that is subjected to up to three years in prison, and they're also asking OTC dealers. Uh, they're obliging them. They're not asking them. They're forcing them to report all transactions involving rubles in Russian IP address addresses to the tax authorities. So if you're in Russia, make sure you're using a VPN or Tor. I'm sure many Russians are are. Uh, wise on that already, but just Learn in case. What about Bitcoin privacy pitfalls and techniques? You know, yeah. You know, the, the good, the one good news here is that it looks like this is a proposed plan. It's not been enacted yet, so maybe it doesn't happen. But I do think this happens in lots, lots of places around the world. Um, yeah, at least over the short term, and then maybe it gets pulled back. But like a lot of people will get. Uh, or in for a surprise. Yeah, we're delving into the uh, the news that makes us mad section. We haven't finished uh, all the good news yet, uh, so we'll, we'll we'll mix in the good news and the bad here. Uh, two points of good news: Square Crypto uh, granted BTC Pay Server with another hundred thousand dollar grant uh, and launches a proper a proper a proper portal for their work, which is squarecrypto.org. So you can follow what they're contributing to there. Um, uh, I believe the BTC Pay grant was the first recurring grant that they've uh, offered to a grant recipient, which is good to see them re-upping that, uh, getting skin in the game. I think we mentioned this last week. I think we have this on the list because of squarecrypto.org. But again, can't be said enough times. BTC Pay server is one of our favorite projects in the space, doing God's work to contribute to the self-sovereign sovereign nature of Bitcoin and, and the uh, closed-loop Bitcoin economy. And this was really cool to see Namecheap, actually the DNS provider of TFTC.io, is now accepting Bitcoin via BTC Pay Server. They were accepting it through BitPay before, for what it's worth. Yeah. They were one of the first, but now they've, they haven't dropped BitPay yet. So it's, a, it's bittersweet. They've just added BTC Pay as an option. So if you're using Namecheap and paying in Bitcoin, make sure you go out of your way to use the BTC Pay Server option. I imagine BitPay is short for this for them because like 
they have to pay fees to BitPay, so why would they continue once they realize that BTC Pay works great? Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, and back to uh, news that makes us mad. Uh, Venezuela government is requiring the use of national mining pools. So if you're a miner in Venezuela, the, the Maduro regime is attempting to re- require uh, miners to point their hash at a national mining pool that I believe the Venezuelan government is thinking about spinning up. Uh, a few things here. Number one, I would not trust this mining pool. They're definitely going to charge <laughs> exorbitant fees. Number two, um, I uh, hope that if you're in Venezuela mining, you're mining off-grid and hopefully using a VPN or any services that you can. I think VPN may slow it down too much, so you got to sort of hide uh, how you're delivering your hash. Um, I think ho- you could probably get away with a VPN. You're just going to lose some profitability. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you're going to lose profit. Like, if the Venezuelan government is not only KYCing you, but controlling your reward payouts. Um, it's probably worth that. Like, you're going to lose some profitability there, too, I would say. Yeah. Um, I did see, I forget. God, I wish I had the tweet where this, I think it was No Bullshit Bitcoin. Let me, uh, let me pull up the tweet from No Bullshit Bitcoin, because there was a Venezuelan miner that hopped in that, that thread and said they're not worried, uh, particularly. They actually think individual miners, uh, Within Venezuela, they're going to create their own pool. Um, Why would they create their own pool instead of just using one of the established ones? That's that a good point. Lower variance. Let me find this. Um, give me a second here. You know, I mean, it comes down to enforcement, right? And they're not going to be able to fully enforce it, but on the bigger operations, they'll be able to enforce it. And they'll make an example out of some people who don't comply. We already know that Venezuelans has seized the miners um, in the past if you don't play ball with them. Um, so it's not that much of a surprise, but this should be a concern to people. Um, the, another thing I didn't have on the list was the, was the attempted WeChat TikTok ban. And I think when you look at combination of this the the Russian disclosures and the WeChat TikTok ban, you're kind of starting to see what the framework, what what the play the playbook would be to try and attack Bitcoin. Um, it'd be way more effective on some of these shitcoins if you wanted to use it to attack something like ETH. I mean, in the in the WeChat TikTok um, executive order from Trump, like he's explicitly called out like using AWS to host host. WeChat messages and and WeChat transactions that were happening. Um, So like you hit the you hit the servers, you you tell people that they need to disclose their addresses, you tell the miners they have to use your mining pool, and then you you try enforcement, you know, enforcement is going to is going to be hit or miss, but but you're going to get some people and you're going to scare a large amount of people into complying. Yes. Um, I go back and forth. I agree with your tweet about it, or your your thought of the week last week in the stat standard, but I do not like those apps, uh, and I don't think you do either. Yeah, it is a, it is a a an interesting trade off. Do you allow the spyware within your borders, especially considering they don't reciprocate uh, within their borders? Or are you just turning into your enemy at that point if you ban them? It's an interesting. Well, debate. I mean, look, I think I think we should live in a world where the apps you don't like can't be banned. So yeah, exactly. Eh, I agree with that. Don't download the spyware, people. TikTok's got like it was hilarious that uh, if you watch the NFL this week, TikTok's got like a huge uh, ad campaign going on right now. I mean, that's got to be the strategy, right? You got to go for hearts and minds. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, it's interesting too because you also have on the side you have the Tim Apple fight, um, where they're trying to you know keep their app store restricted so they get the thirty percent cut. Um, and I don't know if you saw, but like Epic games just got, they were the ones who put their neck out at first, but they just got joined by proton mail, Spotify, and a couple others, a couple other big dogs that are all like trying to push for, um, the ability to make their own app store so that they don't have to pay Apple a 30% cut. Yeah. How much of Apple's revenue does that make up? A shit ton. Yeah. They're trying, you know, it's this whole new idea, like become a service business rather than a hardware business. What would Steve Jobs think of this? Um, I, I mean, I think he loved his uh, 
his paywalls and his his closed systems. He was a big fan of it. Right. He saw the value in it. Yeah. Um, it should be an interesting fight, but it definitely does make their platforms more susceptible to these government interventions. I mean, um, the on the WeChat side, it's it's really interesting that they're going after servers because this is this is exactly like the type of playbook that that people have theorized with with shit coins before which is like you go after infura right you go after you know there's like four or five providers of ethereum nodes as a service like you go after them and you go after the people that they host with so you go after microsoft azure you go after aws um and that's what they're doing with wechat but with tiktok it's much simpler with tiktok they just say it's not allowed on the app stores um so with with iphone you're shit out of luck you can't get the updates anymore for tiktok but on android at least you you could either install your own app store if you want or you can sideload an apk so it's a different censorship resistance model because of their of, of the way those two companies are, are are handling their app stores handling their platforms yeah more freedom on android who would have thunk it google yeah well, it's always been more open. It's just, you know, run by a surveillance company. So. Right. Um, all right. Continuing on subjects that make us angry. FinCEN, uh, BuzzFeed, a blog that I, I usually don't ha- hold in high regard. I actually put out some good investigative journalism. Uh, like every once in a while, they hit us with some random investigative journalism piece that's, like, really top-notch. Yeah, and this is one of them. Uh, so the FinCEN files, they uh, did this in conjunction with a bunch of other uh, uh, media companies around the world and the uh, the international journalists, something-something. Uh, they got their hands on, uh, I believe, something like 2,100... Uh, uh, what, what are they called? SARS, the... Uh, Suspicious activity reports. Suspicious, yes, yeah, suspicious activity reports that have been uh, that have been uh, sent to FinCEN by the major banks of the world. And these suspicious activity reports basically uh, are reports to the bank saying, "Hey, there's people that are doing some suspicious suspicious activity, moving large amounts of money, potentially money laundering, or supporting drug dealers, uh, kleptocrats, uh, corrupt regimes around the world." Uh, yet these transactions still get through the banks deal with these customers uh, and the the su- suspicious activity reports uh, we're coming to find are, are basically just a, a way for these banks to wash their hands clean uh, of any uh, any culpability in this. So they, they send the reports and then they facilitate the transactions anyway. It just highlights the two-tiered justice system that we live that we live under, these large banks that have been screwing over the world for some time now are able to service large drug cartels again corrupt regimes and other nefarious activities uh while the common man is uh is getting the whole book of the law thrown at him for for very minor infractions especially when you compare them to the amount of fraud that's enabled at this level which is trillions of dollars over the last 12 years yeah i mean i think it highlights a bunch of things that are really interesting uh, that we've discussed on this pod. One coin got called out. A lot, a lot, which is, yeah, one coin was in it. Which is, well, first of all, is that these big bureaucracies are inefficient and they lack accountability. Um, so they end up being very ineffective. Um, they each, like, just create plausible deniability for themselves. So it's like th- there's no one for it to actually fall on. The second thing is that the m- overwhelming majority of money laundering is happening in traditional finance systems. They're not happening in Bitcoin. Um, the, the third thing is, is that the collection of this information in KYC is extremely dangerous. Um, if FinCEN cannot protect this information, which they cannot, clearly, um, then they should not collect it. And then the fourth thing is, is it's absolutely bullshit because they're letting the overwhelming majority of money laundering go through while they're putting their citizens at risk by, by forcing the collection of the information. And in a lot of times, they're, they're putting businesses out of business because of the overbearing regulations that, that prevent them being competitive in America versus in other countries. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly the point I was just about to bring up. Like It's so ironic, the, the fact that the solutions to these uh, problems of money laundering and facilitating fraud on a scale that 
<laughs> make uh, many of the criminals and throughout history blush. Uh, the solutions to these problems basically consolidate more power into the people that are facilitating this. And so yes, they uh, make more regulation. Like Matt said, it makes it burdensome for smaller businesses to comply. So they fall out of favor. And as we've seen throughout history, these nefarious actors don't care about laws. They don't care about laws. They're breaking the law and they know it. And to think that they're not going to continue doing that because you make more regulations is just asinine. Where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, as we've seen throughout history, these banks have a price point at which they will facilitate this crime. And to think it'll be any different moving forward uh, because of these leaks is uh, naive, to say the least. I'm into that. Yeah. Screw FATFA. And a lot of this has to do with uh, appeasing FATFA, a, a supranational, unelected uh, regulatory body that you didn't vote for and they control the way we send money around the world. Fuck FATFA. It's just been like a fucking crazy week for confirming my biases. Just like, and, and like in the worst ways ever. It's like, they're like the worst told you to to be happening. Right. But, uh, it has it has been a crazy week in in regard to that. Yeah. Um, last Eric's actually, and I threw something at the end of the list. I don't know if you saw that. I just want to mention that. But first, before we get to that, uh, the DOJ announced uh, Tuesday of this week, September twenty second, the international law enforcement operation targeting opioid traffickers on the dark net has resulted in over 170 arrests worldwide in the seizure of weapons, drugs, and over 6.5 million dollars. So, worth uh, of, of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Yes. Um, so they're calling this operation and cash, I guess. Some cash. Let me see. Let me type in crypto. Uh, so cryptocurrency. 11 pounds of methamphetamine, alleged accepted payment, cryptocurrency, primarily yeah, Bitcoin. Over 6.5 million in both cash and virtual currencies. Yeah. 500 kilos of drugs. One person. What dark net was it? It's 170 just... people. It was multiple dark nets. Yeah. Did you see Disruptor? It was the name of the operation. They always come up with clever names. Sabotor. S A B O T O R. Um, Operation Saboteur. Oh, what is Disruptor? Oh, they they have two names there. I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, Disruptor builds oh, on the success. Oh, last year's was Saboteur, and this yes. year's was Disruptor. Such uh, clever names. Hey, they're getting creative. They have some creative minds in the Department of Justice. Yeah, but anyway, this is. Well, uh, and so, I read about the FinCent leaks in the Bent. I believe it was Monday. Might have been Tuesday. Um, today is Thursday. But yeah, like I said, if you haven't read that, I said um, in that issue, like, is this drug war really worth it? Like, why are we making criminals out of these people? Like, again, the FinCEN uh, leaks are highlighting the fact that it's becoming extremely hard to to focus on the crimes that are worth focusing on. Like, all these regulations and wars on abstract objects like drugs and the war on drugs they just create a bunch of criminals that they really should start considering like do we want to create the headache uh around this stuff and just make a bunch of people criminals for stuff that many people myself included would argue is like hey if you want to do that if you're an individual of free will and you want to engage in those activities you should be able to it would probably reduce crime it would reduce the um, the draw to do that stuff because when you make things illegal, it makes people with certain mindsets want to do it more. Uh, if you're, if it's made legal or decriminalized, um, at least you, you, you make it, uh, more, um, more probable that people will create services that, that service, uh, addicts in, in better ways and, 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 uh, make it publicly acceptable to, admit that you have a problem and, and solve that problem. And, uh, it's just really infuriating. I just went on a weird rant there, but whatever. Uh, one interesting take was our, our boy dark dot fail uh, said on Twitter was he's like, this isn't the war on drugs. This is the war on privacy. 
um, which I thought was very interesting. Disruptor, um, saboteur. Yeah, like they're go they're going after these private marketplaces, right? And these message boards and these private communities, and and they want to make a point, uh, and and they they don't they don't want people working outside of the system. Um, the other thing that I think is important here is that a lot of people, myself included, think it's very unlikely for uh, countries, and especially in this current geopolitical climate, to come together, work together for a common goal. And a lot of times that is in, in you know, discussion of, of Bitcoin and, and, and state, state threats of, of Bitcoin, you know, on Bitcoin and, and, and that threat model. Um, it turns out, you know, that if if they're sufficiently motivated in something they don't like, um, they they can work together, you know. And this 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 uh, operation specifically was like a ton of European countries, U.S. and Canada, that they all work together and they hit people all in these different countries at the same time, so they wouldn't get spooked. Yeah, they'll come together to uh, to inhibit uh, privacy and sovereign sovereignty of individuals they don't want you to be free freaks they hate you they all fucking hate you um but we're going to end on a good note unless you have anything to add to that map um well i saw what you added but we actually have two things left what's the other thing uh bitcoin q a released his whirlpool fee calculator at whirlpoolfees.com oh uh, yeah oh i didn't see that on the and, list is that on the uh, list he i put it in at the end and he uh he has a portal that just like lists all of his great, uh, his great guides and all the different content he's done, and that's getbitcoin.help. Um, so it's it's whirlpoolfees.com is is the whirlpool fee calculator, and it's really nice because it includes the mining fees, um, which is is important if if I'm right about mining fees going up. Um, that you're able to get a clear calculation there, and his his portal for all of his content is getbitcoin.help. Yes, uh, shout out to Bitcoin Q and A, putting out incredible content, trying to help people who are trying to help themselves via Bitcoin. So go check that out. And then lastly, what I add to the list is uh, I just thought this was pretty cool. Luke Childs uh, so cool. teased it. Uh, Umbrella wallet support. They're supporting a bunch of different wallets. Wasabi, Blue Wallet. Um, uh, let me pull up the tweet. And Blue just, wallet, green wallet, Electrum. Yeah, I think that was it. Phoenix wallet. For uh, now. Oh, Phoenix. Yeah. A lot of them are just Electrum wallet, but yeah. like Electrum wallet backend. But what's cool about this is that he, it's once again, it's like Umbral, like making the UX very nice, you know? And for a lot of these wallets right now, you're still going to have to copy and paste the string in. But they're providing the QR code. So those devs of those wallets can make it so you can just scan the QR code. And that's what we want. We want to be able to just easily connect your node through Tor with your wallet by scanning the QR code. That's fucking beautiful. Yes. Make that the standard. Shout out to the Umbrel team. Uh, really incredible UX. And yeah, go check this out. We'll link to the uh, the, dem- or the uh, demo, I guess you can say, the GIF that shows how it works. It's really sleek. Yeah. To be clear here, like my node and Noddle and uh, Raspberry Blitz, they have this same capability. What's really cool here is that it's all in the same spot. The UX is nice. It shows the QR code. It's not just a copy string. Yes. But I um, love it. I'm a huge fan. Shout out to you guys. You have anything else we got to riff on here before we wrap up? I still have to write the bent. I haven't had time to write the bent yet today. That's the beauty of the bent is that they never know what time they're going to get it. You're getting a late one today, freaks. It's always 8 a.m. somewhere, freaks. <laughs> yeah, that's actually the mentality I've adopted. That's the beauty <laughs> of having a global audience. It is crazy. <laughs> Somebody asked me that uh, the other day. Like, do you have a global audience? It's like, it seems so. So shout out actually, to you, freaks. When you send it, when you send it, you should look up like where it's 8 o'clock in the morning and you should just start off your bent like, good morning, like Nicaragua. Or good whatever. morning, Australia. Yeah. Good morning, Hawaii. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, life's good. You know, I love you, freaks. I uh, miss you, Marty. Uh, go on a road trip. Enjoy uh, Enjoy your country. I co-sign that. Uh, 
yeah, no, again, just want to reiterate, love to you guys tune in and join us every week for this. We love doing it. We love you. Uh, if you're liking it, uh, tell your friends. Give us Stay a review. Humble stack sets. Give us a review. Share. Be good to your family. Subscribe. Engage. Take care. Peace and love.